guys can be seated. So we, we've decided to take this summer, and um, we're walking through the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of the, the longest sermons that Jesus preached in Matthew chapter 5. And what we've decided to do here in, in this series is to focus on each of the blessed statements that Jesus makes. And what we find when we, when we study the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is clearly laying out the gospel in these first few verses. For instance, in week one, we said that the, the statement that Jesus made was blessed are, anybody remember? The poor in spirit, right? And, and when we talk about poor in spirit, what Jesus was, was referring to was recognizing that spiritually you are bankrupt. You can't do anything to gain salvation. It is nothing that you can do. It is outside of your control. So within, within that first of, of his statements of blessed are the poor in spirit, what, what he's saying is you have to at some point acknowledge that you are a sinner and it is outside of your control to be able to do anything. Okay, So, so step one in the gospel message that Jesus is preaching is acknowledge that you're powerless and that you're a sinner in need of a savior. And then last week, we said this in week two, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. This wasn't about a, a physical mourning and just crying and being upset about things in life, but it was just understanding of mourning over our sin, that how our sin is in direct conflict with who God is, and our sin gets in the way. And it was because of that sin that Jesus would come and he would become our righteousness on our behalf, would take on sin, so that you and I could have this relationship with him. So in, in week one, it was acknowledging that we're a sinner. In week two, it is confessing those sins to him. And then this week, in week three, Jesus gives us this verse. He says that blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed. And let's go ahead and throw it out there. Week one, acknowledge you're a sinner. Week two, you confess. Week three, you give Jesus control. He is King Jesus reigning on his throne of your life. You hear in this, this statement, we give our resignation of being the CEOs of our life and giving Jesus absolute full control. Now, I think you would agree with me. People love power. Am I right? I know as dads, we love power. The bigger the grill, right? The hotter it gets, the better. The faster the drill. We don't want some little baby drill. We want a big one that will put 15 holes in the wall in a matter of like three seconds. We love, we love power, right? We love a remote control. Lose it and watch what happens in the home. Anybody got multiple remotes, especially Apple remotes? Anybody got multiple Apple remotes? Those things disappear all the time. Apple knows what they're doing. We love power. We, power is something that, that we all love. Men, women, we, kids, the kids like to get power. Go, go on a, a a basketball court with a bunch of little boys when they got to pick teams. Picking the teams is not the problem. Picking who's going to be the captain is the problem. You know what I'm saying? Like there'll be fist fights on the basketball court before the court, the game ever starts because people love power. It's intoxicating. And people will do almost anything to be able to get power, right? They'll do anything they can to get power and not only to get it, but to keep it and, and to keep power they will do whatever is in their path to break relationships, to, to deceive people, to lie, to manipulate situations because we have this addiction to power because in our minds, power represents our identity or it's a celebrity, it's a status. People want power because it gives them, here you go, power gives people the illusion that they are in control. But it doesn't matter how much power you have, it is just an illusion that you're in control because at the end of the day, there's only one person that has 100% control of what's going on. And, here, and here's what I would say, it's not us. So we can have this illusion because if we understand that we're poor in spirit, we don't have full power. So we gotta go plug in to where the power is. We, we, listen, we are just the extension cord that the power flows through. So we need to be plugged in to the source, and the source is the Father. So Jesus is, is teaching this, this idea that he's saying, you know, blessed are the meek. He, he's talking about these attitudes of the kingdom. If you want to be a kingdom person, 
These are the traits. This is the DNA of what it means. It means that we, we are poor in spirit. We recognize that we're sinners. We recognize that we have no control. We mourn over those sins. Our hearts break for the things that break God. And here he's like, listen, blessed are the meek. Now, he didn't say blessed are the weak. Blessed are those who love to get run over. That's not what he's saying. But I think a lot of times when we read this verse, we see it as not as a place of, of power, but we see it as a place of meekness of like, gosh, I just got to be a doormat for people to walk all over. You ever read that verse that way? And, and, but here's what I want to tell you. Jesus is not preaching that. He did not call us to be doormats to be walked all over. He's called us to stand, okay, in truth, preaching both truth and grace. But people think of meekness as weakness. If you're meek, you're weak. But meekness is not an attribute that people strive for because they feel like it doesn't get you anywhere. And meekness will not get you anywhere from an earthly kingdom standpoint. But from a kingdom perspective, it will get you everywhere. Because, see, this idea is so countercultural to the audience that Jesus is preaching to here in Matthew chapter 5, which is a Jewish audience. And it is so countercultural to the, con the, the conditions that we live in here in, on earth not just in the United States, but everywhere. Because again, power is the thing that everybody strives for. We, we see if you, if you strive for meekness, meekness will get you left behind. You will not have a seat on the bus in life. But being meek does not mean that you know, we're, we're timid or we're frail or we have a lack of conviction or that we're just seeking peace at whatever the cost. It doesn't mean that we're soft. It doesn't mean that we're spineless. It doesn't mean that we become some doormat for people to walk all over. Now, when Jesus is preaching this, they're hearing it. This, this first century Jewish audience is hearing this. But, but I want you to put it up against the backstop because here's what they're thinking. A Messiah has come to free us of our oppressors, the Romans, because they have been oppressed. They can't have jobs. They can't have anything without going through the Roman government that is over them. And so they're waiting on this Messiah who's going to come and is going to declare war, and Israel is going to take over their city. They're going to get everything back, and they're going to kick the Romans out, and this is what the Messiah is going to do. So here it is, the, the Messiah standing in front of them, and they're expecting a William Wallace kind of guy. Y'all know that movie Braveheart? Great movie. It's a good Father's Day movie. Or he's going to be some type of Navy SEAL. But Jesus goes, hey, not go in with your swords and take them out. Not putting on the war paint and crying freedom. He says, listen, blessed are the meek. And they're like, uh, what? You kidding that's not the way that we push out the oppression. That's not the way that, that we get rid of the, the Roman enemy. Because Jesus, I don't think you understand. Y'all made that statement before too, I'm sure. But they're like, Jesus, you don't understand. Meekness doesn't get you anywhere. Like, they're an oppressor. They, they have come down on us. They have taken our city. They have taken our homes. Many of our people have been put in jail. Many of our people have, have been persecuted. Many have died. Great causes, Jesus, aren't fought by the meek. And this is why this beatitude for this audience was so hard to embrace. Because it wasn't going to get them anywhere in their minds. Because they're thinking from an earthly kingdom standpoint. Because their kingdom was within the walls of the city, Jerusalem. And Jesus was going, no, 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 guys. You don't, you're missing the point. This is why when he tells them, in Matthew chapter 28 that they're going to go to all of the world. They're like, we've never left the walls of Jerusalem. We've never left outside of the boundary of Israel. What do you mean? And because their, their focus, their perspective was right here. They had blinders on. They couldn't see anything past the earthly kingdom. So they were, they were missing what Jesus was trying to say. They could not embrace this counter-cultural teaching. Because you, you cannot win victories if you're crying, right? You're not going to win. Your, your team's not going to win if, if they're cuddled up in the dugout crying. You got me? That's going to be the Braves in a couple of weeks when they play my Dodgers. Nobody amen them. A lot of enemies. You can't have victories if you're being meek. So this phrase, blessed are the meek, would have definitely brought up that question, are you kidding me? 
uh, the concept of a messianic kingdom, Jesus, I don't think you're the one. I don't think you know what you're talking about. And some people will walk away from him and not have anything else to do with him because of the statement. Because it doesn't line up with their thought process. It doesn't line up with their politics. It doesn't line up with their belief system. Because they have their truths. And it's countercultural. And if, we're, if, we, if we are truthful, I think we would all agree that sometimes we do not understand the power of meekness, do we? Why, why would Jesus tell us to be meek? So, so if meekness doesn't mean for us to be weak or soft or spineless, then what does it mean when he says that blessed are the meek? Now, the Hebrew word here is used to describe someone who is submissive to the will of God. Submissive to to the will of God. So the meek person then is not weak, but it's a person who demonstrates power under the control and the submission of God. The Greek word means power under control, bridled strength. Here's the picture analogy. Imagine a thoroughbred horse. Now, this horse, you go and slap it, bad things can happen, right? You do not want to be kicked by a horse. Great YouTube videos if you don't believe me. But this horse, so big, so mighty, can do whatever it wants to, can come and go wherever it wants, can walk all over you, and it has a ton of power to it. But what happens? We take this horse and we put a bridle on it, and we can control and harness that power and have that horse go in whatever direction. And it's amazing what people do with horses. They can make them jump. They can make them walk backwards. They can make them stand and wave their their hooves at you. There's all kinds of things that they can do. This is the picture analogy that Jesus is using. He's saying, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who come under the control of the master. That you're powerful, you think you're powerful, you think you have all this, but it needs to be harnessed and it needs to be bridled. So Jesus is saying, blessed are those who will give full control to the Father, not in yourself. Now, you can't have this verse without blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are those who are mourning because you can't trust the control of the Father if you haven't realized that you have no power to do anything except to make things worse. And so here, Jesus has given us this this Greek analogy word of saying a a meek horse is not a weak horse. It's a thriving beast that is under the master's control. Now, I'm not a horse rider. I don't trust him, right? I trust a cat before I trusted a horse, and that's saying a lot. But I remember my uncle, for whatever reason, got this bright idea growing up that he was going to have a horse farm. Now, he was an auto body guy, okay? I don't know where horses came from, but he decided to throw some horses in the backyard. And one day we went out to ride the horse. And these things were like running everywhere, kicking and making whatever horse noises they make. And and he's like, do you want to ride one? And I thought, this is a really bad idea. But sure, let's do it. And he warned me that if you let go of this bridle, it's on. Like you lose control because that horse will fully take the power from you. And so I remember grabbing that bridle with everything that was worth and squeezed it because I was not, because if I fell off the horse, the bridle was coming with me, right? And it was amazing to take such a a massive animal and harness that power and make it go right and make it go left, to stay away from the water, to stay away from the electric fence, right? Because that's meekness. And so handing over the bridle to Jesus and admitting that we need God to take control. Ladies and gentlemen, that is salvation. That is when we surrender our lives to Jesus by saying, you have full control. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe you're who you say you are. I'm broken over my sins. I confess my sins to you, Jesus. I give my life to you. This is the salvation. Blessed are the ones who hand over the bridle to Jesus. Blessed are the ones who surrender full control to the Father. Because uncontrolled power does nobody any good, right? 
if power is not harnessed and it's not controlled and people are just using it however they want to use it, it's not good for anybody because we abuse power. Think about it. Have you ever felt like exploding at someone because you were so angry? Yeah? Okay. I was about to say, this church is a lot holier than I thought it was. There, there are moments to where you, you feel like you're about to explode at somebody, that you're so angry at people and you don't, you don't know how to feel, you just want to explode and it's just an atom bomb that goes off and the relationship is just devastated and it goes away. So to be meek is to have the power to say, I'm going to be very careful here and I'm not going to blow up. I'm going to keep my facial composure. I'm going to internally take some breaths and I'm probably going to walk away from this conversation and come back. That, that is having that power harnessed and controlled. One person put it this way is that when you idle your motor and you just feel like shifting the gears and stripping all the gears in your motor. You're just going to let the motor idle a little bit, and then you're not going to get carried away. That's the idea of being meek, of, of, of harnessing that, just being patient with that. Meekness and gentleness come directly from being poor in spirit and mourning over our sins. Meekness is, and gentleness come directly from being poor in spirit and mourning over our sins. That's why I said you can't, you can't take these verses and divide them up and live whichever one you want. Jesus is saying if you're going to be kingdom focused and kingdom living, then you have to have these first three. You have to have them. You, you, you have to be poor in spirit. You have to be mourning. You have to be meek. So if we look at Numbers chapter 12, this will give us a little idea of this word meekness. It's about a guy named Moses. You know him. But Miriam and Aaron, it says, they spoke out against spoke out against Moses because of the woman that he married. He married a Cushite woman. For he had married her, and verse 2 says, And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us too? There's a little bit of an attitude. Can you read that attitude there? And the Lord heard it. In, in other words, the Lord heard their complaining. He says, Okay, noted, noted. Now the man Moses, listen to this, the man Moses was what? What does that say? Very meek. More than all the other people who were on the face of the earth. Wow, what a great thing to be said about you. Oh, yeah, I, I know who that is. They're, they're one of the, they're super meek. Like the meekest person you will meet on the face of the earth. And this is God, by the way, saying this. Now, the man Moses was very meek more than all the other people. Now, Moses did also write the book of Numbers, but, you know, take that for what it's worth. Because I'm sure if I wrote a book of the Bible, I'd also label myself as John, like the beloved disciple of all the others. And he said, And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, Come out, you three. You come out to the tent of the meeting, and, and the three of them came out. Now here, here's the story set up. Because of Moses' choice and who he married, Miriam and Aaron had a problem with it. And instead of going directly to him to have this conversation, because he was meek, they knew it. He wasn't going to explode on them. They decided to have this whole conversation kind of behind his back. And they begin to question, is God calling this guy to be the prophet to Israel? They're questioning his role among the people. This is a personal attack on the integrity and the identity of who Moses is. But next thing the, the verses tell us here is very interesting. In verse 4, it says, And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam. Isn't it amazing how the Lord works? He will refer to all parties and speak to them when it needs to be dealt with. And he says, You come out, you three, to the tent of the meeting. You come to the meeting place where I'm at. And the three of them came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud, and he stood at the entrance of the tent, and he called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forward. This is being called to the, 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 the principal office of the divine. Okay, So God calls them to the principal's office. And he said, you hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth. Clearly I don't speak in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you too afraid? To speak against my, uh, not afraid to speak against my servant Moses. And the anger of the Lord, and this is what's scary, the anger of the Lord kindled against them. And you ready for the most devastating part of this verse? And he departed, left them. Now, the lesson Moses is meek, more than, remember, all the other people on the earth. 
And in here, Moses' meekness is displayed in his response. Or what, what did Moses say here in his response? What, anybody remember what Moses said in this? He didn't say anything. Because God is speaking on his behalf. God is defending him. God is fighting for him. And so in his meekness, he is rewarded by God's intervention and his vindication of his servant Moses. In other words, sometimes that we decide we need to be the voice in the problems and show our power and, and lack of control. And when we do that, we blur and muddy the water. And God said, I speak on your behalf. I will vindicate on your behalf. I will do what I need to do on your behalf. You just need to be quiet. Isn't that a great spiritual lesson for us to learn? Is sometimes we just need to be quiet and let the Lord fight the battle. So meekness, and we see this with Moses, it is a way of life. He didn't just become the most meek person overnight. It was a way of life. It's living a life of trust and of patience and trusting that God is interested in our lives and that not only does he care deeply about us, but it's because of this that the meek person can be patient as they wait on God to act. So you are blessed when you trust in God and you wait for God to act. This is giving him full control of your life. Now there's a, there's a picture here of meekness and I want to paint it quickly. But if, if, if you want to know what a picture of meekness is, one of that would, snapshots of that would be that you trust in God. That you trust him. And that goes beyond, you know, like, yeah, we know that. But, but do we? Because I feel like sometimes we trust God so much for salvation in the moment to save us from our sins, but that trust seems to linger and not be so much as in depth when we go through life. Isn't it amazing? Like, we'll trust God for our salvation, but I'm not going to really trust him on this decision if I should take this job or not, if I should marry this person or not, if I should do this or not. Isn't that interesting? But if God cares so deeply for your salvation, why do we not trust him with everything else that's going on around us? Because if there was one that I was going to doubt, it wouldn't be that he's going to work these things around us. It's like, where am I going to spend eternity? Is it with him or, or apart from him? So there's, meekness begins when we put our trust in God. This is where we're saying, God, save me from myself. Save me from my sin. And the meek person is strong because he trusts in God and therefore is totally preoccupied with God's ways, not our ways. Because we recognize that his ways are much higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So a, a, a snapshot number one would be the fact that we trust in God. Here's the second one, is that we would commit our way to God. That we're going to... We're going to put our lives in a place of saying, God, you have control. And you can have self-control if you know that God is in control. Because he fights for us. He speaks for us. He goes before us. We see all that through the Old Testament, especially leading the children of, of Israel to the promised land. God always goes before them. And is always out in front with the provision, making the preparation, doing everything that he needs to do out front. So we just have to trust that the Father's gonna do what's best for us. Maybe not what we want, but he's gonna do what's best. And when I know that God's gonna do what's best, I don't have to feel like I have to have control. I can have self-control and be like, God has got this. And sometimes we just need to realize that God has got this. We stress over things. We don't sleep at night over things. There are things going on in your life right now that you can't sleep on, that you're worried about, you're having anxiety about. Let me tell you, surrender that to Jesus and have some self-control and recognize that God is in control of whatever that is. We're sleeping on the wrong thing. That he wants to, he wants to do things in your life, but you've got to recognize that his way is higher and we got to commit to it. And here's what's funny about that word commit, because when, when you look at it in the Hebrew word for commit, literally means to roll. Like when I commit, meek, meek people discover that God is trustworthy, and they say, I'm going to roll that way. I'm going to roll these problems over to God. I'm going to roll this anxiety over to him. I'm going to roll these things over to him. That's committing. of just rolling it all off, giving God whatever it is. Because God's the one that can cope with our complexities. God's the one that can cope with our pressures. God's the one that can cope with any obstacle of life that comes our way. Because when we're meek, we're saying that we trust that God is able. And that he's willing to sustain us and guide us and protect us. And there's an amen right there from somebody. Because if you don't get that, you miss the picture. 
Jesus is not telling us to be a doormat. What he's doing is saying that when we're meek, we have a trust that he's in control, and all we're doing is pointing people to Jesus. Because I, I am not, and, and I think you would admit it with yourself as well, there's some days I am not a very good portrayal of my Savior. Anybody else? Like there are often days, that, and I love this saying, but there are often days that my life looks more like someone who needs Jesus than it does actually looks like Jesus. But if I'm pointing to him, there's no mistake about it. Don't get it twisted with who I am. I'm a sinner. Paul said, look, that, this guy. Look at John chapter 1 when he says that he was the light. And John said, I wasn't the light. People think I'm the light. I'm not the light. He's the light. He's that guy. Look to him. So we've got to get to a place, understand that God is in control. We can stop pacing back and forth. And we can just sit quietly, understanding that God is in control of every facet of your life. All you have to do is exercise your meekness and your restraint because God has you in his plan and he has you in his care. Which leads us to the, the third point here is that snapshot number three is meekness is you're, you're quiet before God and you wait for him. You ever rush the process? You ever got ahead of yourself? You ever rush this? And he says that God knows what's going on in you. God knows what's going on around you because biblical meekness is rooted in deep confidence that God is for you and not against you. And when you know that that's the case, as a follower of him, there's a steady calm that comes from knowing that God is omnipotent. He is everywhere. He is powerful. And that he has all of our affairs under his control. And that he is gracious to work throughout life for whatever is best for us. Psalms chapter 37, Jesus, when he, when he is preaching, blessed are the meek, he, he's referring to Psalm 37. He says, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight the themselves in abundant peace. See, the blessing comes with the promise, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. Because they will inherit the land. They will inherit the earth, the earth and they will delight in this abundant peace. So what does that mean? Because that's really weird, right? Because don't we live on earth? Do we inherit it already? In this verse, the Hebrew word meek is used to describe someone who's being submissive to the will of God. And so when he says that you will inherit, and he's talking about the earth, he's saying you inherit the earth, all the good things that God has made, all the good gifts that offers to us, his children, this is what he's given us. The, the earth represents the goodness and the fullness of of God, both in this life and the life that is to come. So, so blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. They will inherit the earth. Now, here's why I think the word inherit is really interesting how this word choice is used here. Because what do you have to do to inherit something? Nothing. The only way that you can inherit something is to be rightly related to a person who has something to give away. And the only way to inherit the earth is to be rightly related to the one who owns the earth, and that is God himself. And he's saying, if you want to inherit the earth, then you, you submit your control to the Father. And you will inherit the goodness and the blessing of who our Father God is. For anybody that doesn't surrender their life to the new heaven and to the new earth, if you don't inherit the earth, if you don't surrender your life to Christ, you will get a godless life on earth. So you will get an eternity that is godless. But for those who surrender their lives, they get God here on earth and in eternity. So in general, poverty of the spirit, the beatitude, the first one, is accompanied by mourning over the spirit, which was beatitude number two. These two realities create in us a meekness, both in the way that we respond to the Lord and to the way that we treat others after we've been mistreated. God's new creation is not going to be possessed. And I love this, this thought because the new creation will not be possessed by power hungry people. It will not be full of powerful kings and ruthless dictators and manipulative politicians and high profile athletes or Hollywood elites. 
the, the coming of the kingdom will be possessed by the meek, not the strong or the dominant. Because we will worship one king and one king alone, and that is Jesus. So, so here's, here's our tie up today. And here, here's your takeaway. We have got to stop seeking to get and maintaining power. Instead, we need to rely on the one who has all of the power, and that is Jesus. If we truly believe that he changes everything, why are we not giving him full control? He doesn't need to be the passenger in the vehicle with us. He needs to be the driver who is driving our lives. We have to surrender. We are thoroughbreds, and we have to be controlled. Because Genesis chapter 3 shows what happens when we take anything that we have, we make a mess of it. And see, when Eve grabbed that fruit and disobeyed, in direct disobedience to God, it affected every one of us, didn't it? I mean, guys, how many of you cut grass this week? Thank you, Adam. Your fault, because he said that the cause of the sin, that you're going to pour sweat and you're going to hurt. I think about it every time I cut grass. What were you thinking, Adam? Like, what? Come on, man. This is your fault. I'm sweating and dying out here in this 110 degree heat. But it's a consequence of sin. Like, we, we feel the consequence of sin all around us. What would your life look like if you just told Jesus to take control like in everything and you trusted him? It takes humility to be able to do that. But here's Jesus' promise that if you'll live out the value that way, blessed are the meek. They'll inherit the earth. They will inherit the goodness and the blessing of God. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you today for your, your words. We live in a time that, God, that power is, is so heavily desired at any cost. But your word says that we have received power through the Holy Spirit that controls us, that, that moves in us and leads us and guides us. And I just pray today, like last week, God, the, the prayer was that we would confess our sin to you. Today, I just pray for boldness that we would give up control of our lives and let you have it. In everything, not just in some of the things, but in everything, in all things. So God, as we spend these next moments in worship, I just pray that your spirit would speak loud to us. And God, that we would surrender our lives to you. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.